Okay, hello again. Uh, this time I'm back to using the laptop's built-in mic and the laptop's built-in camera this time, so let me know how this looks. Okay, this video is going to be about how to read the, um, the rules, the sort of definitions of the various rules for natural deduction, as you'll find them in your textbook. Um, so there are three main places you'll find a list of rules. So the textbook has uh, a chapter in TFL and a chapter in FOL where they go through each rule one by one with a bunch of text explaining you explain to you the idea behind each rule. But also helpfully, at the back of the textbook, there's an appendix. Um, this will be on slightly different pages depending on which edition of the textbook you have, whether you bought it from Amazon or from Lulu, um, or depending on which uh, PDF you've downloaded from the from Canvas. Um, but it's going to be in the back. It'll be Appendix C, what you see here on the screen, the quick reference section, uh, a list of basic deduction rules for TFL. So those are two places. Uh, there's a chapter where these are all explained, there's an appendix where they're all listed, and if you look at the Open Logic Project website where you can practice these things, which I'll talk about in a later uh, video, uh, on the sidebar there's again a list of all these things. Um, you might see different names for some of the rules in your textbook versus on the Open Logic Project website. Um, that's again just because of different um, editions, different versions of this textbook. The Open Logic Project website is keyed to our the Calgary edition of For All X, which is what we're using. But some of the uh, rules have been renamed between one thing and the other, but they all work the same. And uh, as far as this class is concerned, you can use whichever names you, for the rules you like. Okay. So let's take a look at some of these rules here. So right now you can see on the screen what the te how the textbook defines rules for conjunction, for negation. Let me just scroll through this a little bit. Um, so we've got conjunction, negation, we have a heading for indirect proof, conditional, explosion, disjunction by conditional. So you notice most of those headings um, are also the names of connectives in TFL, and that's not a coincidence. For most or depending on your version of the textbook, either most or all of the connectives, you'll get a pair of rules. Plus we have some miscellaneous ones. Um, let me first, let's just talk about the rules for, let's actually start with the rules for the conditional. Okay, so we have two rules here that you can see on the screen now. You'll see there's arrow I and below that arrow E. The I and the E here stand for respectively introduction and elimination. So the idea behind these two kinds of rules is, so an introduction rule tells you how you can start with uh, some sentences that don't necessarily have an arrow in them and get to a sentence that does have an arrow. So if you're reading the derivation, the proof from beginning to end, when you do a rule like this, that's where you introduce, you add in an extra arrow. And symmetrically, an elimination rule starts with a sentence that has an arrow in it and gets you to some sentence that has maybe not no arrows, but that particular arrow is gone now. So let's look at what you see there for these two rules. I want to start actually with the elimination rule, uh, which we saw in our example before where I showed you how to set up uh, natural deduction proof in general. So here's what's in the textbook. You see an M and an N on the left of that vertical line. These are, are supposed to be variables that stand in for numbers, right? So remember when we do a natural deduction proof, all of the lines are numbered. So ju just to make this a little clearer because I don't want to scare people who have traumatic memories of algebra. Let's put in some concrete numbers. Imagine, let's say on line six and line seven, we get what? Well, the rule, the statement of the rule has these scripty letters. Scripty A, arrow B, scripty A, and then we get scripty B by arrow elimination on 
the rule says m and n, that just means whatever numbers you've got here. So in this case, 6 and 7. Okay, I said it's important these are scripty letters. Remember, in our textbook, the scripty font means this isn't necessarily an atomic sentence. If we just had a regular italic A, that would mean it's actually the letter A. But when it's a scripty A, we mean this could stand for any sentence, any well-formed formula of TFL is allowed to be in here. The important thing when you've got scripty letters is the pattern of repetition. So if I've got a, a scripty A here and a scripty A there, I can replace those with any TFL sentence I like, as long as I put the same thing in both of the A spaces, and likewise both of the B spaces. So think of these as blanks, think, think of these as empty spaces, we're allowed to insert whatever you want, but the rule is when you see the same letter, you have to put the same thing in the blank. Notice the sort of reverse isn't true. So when you have different letters, that doesn't mean you have to put different sentences in those two, those two places, but it does mean you're allowed to. So think of these things, I say, as blanks. Let's actually write that out. So we've got blank, arrow, blank, blank, therefore blank. What the scripty letters do is sort of tag these blanks and say, well, these are the A blanks, so whatever you put in here, you have to put in everywhere else there's a scripty A. Likewise for B. How do I fill those blanks in? Any way I like. The rule just says, whenever you've got a sentence like this and a sentence like this, then you can put a sentence like this by using that rule. So if I have, let's say, P error of Q, and I have P, same thing, then I can put, has to be this thing. They don't have to be atomic sentences. Maybe I have, in the A blank, I have something like P or Q. That's okay, as long as I have the same sentence here, P or Q. As long as I've got the same thing here and there, it's okay. Okay. Do notice that this rule, arrow elimination, if you want to write some sentence that you're justifying by the rule arrow elimination, you need two different things. Just the arrow sentence by itself, that's not enough. If I know, if I know P, arrow, P or Q, arrow Q, that by itself isn't enough to tell me Q is true. That just says, if I can figure out that this thing is true, then this has to be true. But I need to also know that that thing is true. Otherwise, I don't get anything. Okay. That's how you read this rule. There are other rules where you might only have to cite one line. So let's scroll back up a bit. If we look at conjunction elimination, so these rules here. Conjunction Elimination just says, if I have some and sentence, a conjunction A and B, then I can get A by conjunction elimination on whatever number line that is. If I have an and sentence, that's enough by itself for me to conclude something, right? A and B, and sign B tells me both of these things are true. So it's going to be okay for me to write the left-hand one or the right-hand one. That's different from if I had an arrow here. An arrow sentence needs a helper. You need to know that the antecedent is true in order to figure out the consequent is true. And you can tell that by looking at the statement of the rule, right? When I do arrow elimination, I need to cite two things because in the definition of the rule, we get m comma n. That means I'm citing two lines. Different from and elimination, which only lists one line, line m. Okay. Arrow introduction, the statement there looks different. 
So conditional introduction here, arrow I. Statement of that rule goes like this. This time our lines are numbered I and J. What's the significance of using I and J rather than M and N? Nothing. Doesn't matter. So here's what you see in the textbook. Okay, if I want to get A arrow B by arrow introduction, I need to cite a subproof. This is a range of lines. Notice there's a, a dash rather than a comma connecting the numbers I and J. And up here on those lines, I and J, I see a subproof, so this extra vertical line, which indicates there's a temporary assumption. What am I temporarily assuming? I'm assuming A. What do I find out is true in that case? B. Now, when you look at the statement of the rule in the textbook, there's no space between A and B. We just go A, then B. Don't read into that. When we're stating a rule like this that says you need a subproof, that is a temporary assumption that shows something, we're imagining there's some chain of reasoning that gets you from A to B. As long as you can fill this thing out, so by assuming A and then doing some good reasoning, you can get to B. As long as you can have a subgroup that starts like this and ends like that, then you can stop assuming A and write A arrow B by this rule. That's what this thing is saying. Okay? Just the same, some, there are other rules that say you need a subproof, so indirect proof over here. That says if I want to show some sentence A is true by this rule, I need a subproof that starts by assuming not A and gets to this funny symbol, the upside down T. That's something that means a contradiction happened.